All right, Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> verses 1 to 13. When the day, the day of Pentecost, Pentecost arrived, arrived, they were, they were all, together all together in one place, place. and suddenly there, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and, and it filled the entire house, house where they were sitting. sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And, and they, they were, were amazed and astonished, and astonished saying, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said they are filled with new wine. Lord, we ask you to take your word. We pray, God, that you touch people who are not even here today, but that will listen to this message. We pray, God, you transform all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jennifer. I uh, was listening to a documentary about William Tyndall. And uh, I listened to it halfway in my, I was paying attention, kind of distracted in, in just life <laughs> had me thinking about other things. And um, so I listened to it again uh, yesterday. But it reminded me, William Tyndall was born in 1490 to 94, somewhere in that time frame, in England, in the countryside. And his parents were uh, sellers of cloth. And um, they had sheep and they were countrified type of people. But I guess enough wealth to send him to Oxford, which was one of the greatest um, schools uh, in the world, uh, and still is actually, where he had an excellent education. But William Tyndall was brought up in a Catholic nation. England in the 1500s was uh, strongly Catholic. And when he went to Oxford University, the teaching was based on Catholic teaching. Obviously, there was no separation of church and state back in those days. And, um, well, that caused a lot of conflict and issues. We're also aware that uh, the lingua franca, of the church was Latin, and the Bible was in Latin. So every service, every mass was, uh, was in Latin, which he learned. But the nation spoke English, and there was a marginal uh, education for most people. The common people uh, would, uh, would have barely had, uh, they would have had enough trouble learning to read and write in English, and at a very basic level. So the king and the clergy and the wealthy were all able to, usually were able to speak Latin and were well educated. So there was a separation and there was a use of this as a controlling agent over the people. It was how they made themselves special, especially the Catholic Church and the clergy. They did not want people to learn, uh, to have access to the Bible in their own language or to all of them to, to learn Latin, for instance, which was an impossibility. And they thought, and some of them were like Thomas More, who was a, uh, the head of the parliament under Henry VIII. Um, he was a strong Catholic, and so was Henry VIII. Henry VIII was actually a strong Catholic. That's important to remember when I talk about this. What does this have to do with Pentecost? I'm getting to that. Notice that on Pentecost, God poured out his spirit so everyone could hear the gospel in Latin. No, in their own language. Everyone could hear it in their own native language. The Catholic Church in the 1500s 
actually for a thousand years or more, uh, wanted people not to hear the Scripture, the Bible, in their own language. Which was against the formation of the beginning of the church. They wanted an educated elite class to have control over what the people were learning because they did not believe that people were able, the common man was able to educate himself in the Bible. They were not capable of understanding the Word of God. And if you made it available to everyone, they would corrupt it. And every common person, every plowboy, every farmer, every, every sheep herder would have their own opinion, their own uneducated opinion. So they controlled the word. They didn't trust you to be able to figure it out. But what we had was people controlling the word who didn't really understand it themselves. The way that they used to study the Bible was not to take the text as a whole, but they would study little passages and point them out, and then they would dive into that just that little bit. So what they had was fragmented learning. And on top of that, they began to draw into their teaching Aristotelian philosophy. This was a secular philosophy that came into the Catholic Church. And it, I'm not going to get into all those details. I've talked a little bit about it before. It has some... some the meta, I'm going to use words you're not going to like, but the things to do with uh, the separation of the physical elements and the spiritual elements. And as I've mentioned before, the Jewish thinking, the Eastern thinking, was that they merge together, that there's a, common, there's a relationship between physical and spiritual. But let's not get into that. But, but what it did was it corrupted the spiritual word of God and it allowed philosophy to come part of their teaching, even to this day. The other thing that was peculiar about the Catholic Church and their word, they used a Bible that um, was not, a, it wasn't translated directly from the Greek. It went, they had something called the Vulgate. And the Vulgate was a Hebrew scholars at one point went back and because everybody was speaking Greek at the time, they, they wrote their scriptures in, it's called a Septuagint. Septuagint. And uh, it was in Greek. So they took their Hebrew scriptures and they wrote it in Greek. And then the Latin version, the Vulgate Bible that the Catholic Church used, was a translation not from Hebrew of the Old Testament, but from the Hebrew translated into the Greek and then into Latin. And there were many errors in that translation. The copy uh, was not uh, pure as it should have been. So that was what the Catholic Church was using, something with some corrupted elements in it because of these multiple translations not taken from the original text, and there were other issues there as well. And the Catholic, Catholics believed that the Pope was the divine representative of God, and he superseded the Word of God. And... As we know that the, uh, the Catholic Church began to teach things that were not in the Bible because of this. And here are some examples. There's something called transubstantiation, which is when we take communion, they believed, this is just one example, and they still do, this is what they teach, that the bread and the wine actually turn into the body and blood of Jesus. However, their actual physical elements don't change. Are you having trouble understanding this? Because most Catholics also have trouble understanding this. In fact, most Catholics don't even know that's what the Catholic Church teaches. But <laughs> the polls show that they are unaware of that. They believe it is symbolic. Most Catholics believe that, even though their church actually believes otherwise. Their doctrine is different from that. They also believed in purgatory, which is not in the Bible, it's not uh, in our Bible, of course, um, but it's uh, where you would die, but you're not quietly saved yet. You haven't been good enough, so you end up into this little temporary holding place where you're going to live out another life to try to prove that you're good, and then you'll hopefully go to heaven. And, and then you've also got the prayers of dead saints and prayers to Mary, and none of this is scripturally accurate. In fact, it's, it's a violation of scripture. Well, where did all that come from? It didn't come from your Bible. It came from Catholic teaching from these priests and the popes. And you have this accumulating over 
uh, you know, well over a thousand years, all the way up into the beyond the 1500s. We still have it today. So how does this relate to William Tyndale? William Tyndale was in learning to become a priest while he was at Oxford. And he discovered two teachers, uh, Martin Luther in Germany and Erasmus. And Erasmus was teaching people in the 1500s that you had to go to the original text to understand the Bible. So he, what he did was he wrote a, a, a version of the Bible that was in Greek and then in, in um, Latin, so you could compare the two. And Tyndale got a hold of this, and he said, wow, this is, this is different, you know? And then he, he got a hold of some copies of Luther's works, which were illegal to have, I guess, in England at that time. Uh, and um, he realized that what Martin Luther was saying is that the Scripture is the Word of God, and it is above any teaching of man, any pope, any priest. And in fact, he could look at the Scripture and then see that what the Catholic Church was teaching was out of scope. The Catholic Church was also teaching about indulgences and the works. And the Catholic Church was teaching that the church was the one to decide who was going to go to heaven or hell. They made the determinations. They made the rules and the evaluations. And if they excommunicated you, you were not going to heaven. But Martin Luther was teaching that it, the church is subordinate to the scriptures. And what the scriptures tell us is that we are saved by grace through faith. And William Tyndall believed that. Now, Henry VIII, who became the head of the Church of England and broke away from the Catholic Church, was actually a very ardent Catholic. And he, was a, he even wrote a, a piece that contradicted Martin Luther to claim that Martin Luther was wrong because he wanted to ingratiate himself to the Pope. And he had this guy, Thomas More, who was, working, who was working on his side and the Catholic side, and he was the head of parliament, and he was strongly Catholic. And he said, I will come to the ends of the earth to eliminate William Tyndale. You will. In other words, he was threatening to, get, to kill William Tyndale and get rid of him. Once Tyndale started to write uh, about, um, uh, he wanted, Tyndale wanted to bring the scripture uh, from the original text into English. And Thomas More, the Pope, and King Henry VIII were all opposed to this. So Tyndale had to leave England, and he had to hide in Germany, where he was working for two years on writing the scriptures into English. And that's where Thomas More said he's going to track him down and kill him. And Henry VIII also was trying to get him. The Bishop of London tried to persecute him. And uh, in fact, they ended up, uh, the, the scriptures that uh, Tyndale had translated into English, he had them made in a German printing press. And a friend of uh, the Bishop of London, who was also persecuting uh, Tyndale, had a book published at the same publisher. And he took the guys out who were doing the publishing for drinking and, and eating and drinking. And they said, oh, we're working on this thing. It's, it's, a, it's a Bible in English. And uh, it's a New Testament in English. And we're making 3,000 copies. And it's William Tyndall who's, it's William Tyndall. <laughs> they found out where he was. And then they got the authorities uh, with the Catholic uh, support to shut down the printing press, press and try to stop Tyndall. So Tyndall had to leave again. And he went to another city in Germany. Anyway, he, he, he's always on the run. He's always persecuted. Uh, and, uh, and he wants to get these Bibles printed and sent to England illegally, clandestinely. Henry VIII is going through some issues. He is married to his brother's widow. And... He wants to use the excuse that it's his brother's wife 
and therefore the Bible is against it. So he went, he's looking for an excuse to divorce her because he wants to marry Anne Boleyn, who is a Protestant. And um, so he brings this to the Pope. And he says, look, the Bible says that I should not have my brother's wife. Do you remember that John the Baptist was, was talking to King Herod? He said, you're, you're, you're with your brother's wife. You can't have him. That's, that's against Scripture. So Henry's using that incorrectly to say that he wants to divorce his wife. The difference was Henry's brother had died and she was a widow. And then, Okay, so this issue is fomenting under the surface here, or more than under the surface. Um, and on top of this, King Henry is trying to get the Pope to approve his divorce so he can, so he can marry Anne Boleyn. And the Pope's saying no. Tyndall wrote this, uh, this publication that was sent out all, all over the place that said that he was in favor of, uh, so he's saying that God gave ordained authority to the church on spiritual matters, but God chooses the king and the king actually has authority for secular matters. So Henry saw that and he says, whoa, this guy that I'm persecuting, Tyndall, He's saying that I have authority and the Pope can't tell me what to do as king. Separation of church and state is basically what he's saying. And so he's like excited. He wants Tyndall now to get on his side to help him get this divorce from his wife. But Tyndall writes another article and he says, I don't agree with King Henry. He said, because the Bible also says that if your brother dies, you should marry his wife and take the wife. So he's saying, I don't agree with Henry and his desire to get a divorce. This is not godly. So now Henry's back again. Now he wants to kill Tyndall. <laughs> what happens is uh, Thomas More, who's been ardent Catholic, supporter of King Henry and against Tyndall, looks at this situation and he says, no. King Henry, you can't divorce your wife. And I agree with the Pope. And whatever the Pope says, I, it goes. So King Henry says, I'm going to have you killed, Thomas More. But first, Henry becomes his own Pope over the Church of England. On this issue, he breaks away and he takes what Tyndall said, saying that I'm the king, I can do what I want. See, he's got it all mixed up, but that doesn't matter. Henry wants what he wants, and he's going to do what he wants to do. So he breaks away. But he's still Catholic. He still agrees with everything Catholic. He's just saying, I'm the Pope of England, and you're the Pope of the rest of the Catholic Church. You can't tell me what to do. But he doesn't change any Catholicism other than that. But he gives himself the right to divorce this woman and then marry Anne Boleyn, a Protestant. <laughs> and Henry's the one saying, don't let the common man get the Bible, because then you know we have chaos breaking out, and then there's going to be anarchy. Thomas More is against King Henry, and he says, you can't divorce your wife, and I'm agreeing with the Pope. So Ken, King Henry says, you're going to die, Thomas More. You repent or die. So he orders his execution, but Thomas More was such a good friend of his. <laughs> so what, what, the, what the order was is that it was some horrible death that he was going <laughs> to... It was a combination of castration, and he was supposed to have his bowels poured out while he's still alive, and um, he was going to do all these things. And he said, wait a minute, you've been a good friend all these years. So Henry says, we're just going to cut your head off. <laughs> we're going to call it square. But he's the head of the church. He's the pope who doesn't want the common man to have the Bible and is in strong Catholic, except for his divorce and murdering the guy who has been his best friend all these years. Now, would you want this guy to be the head of your church? Now, Tyndall would not compromise. He, because King Henry said, you come back and you support me, you stop all this stuff, and we'll call it square. And, and Tyndall said they had private meetings uh, with their representatives. Tyndall came and sp spoke to King Henry's um, agents, and uh, he made this offer. And Tyndall said, uh, no, I, I'm not going to do this. Um, and, he, and he had his 
Bibles smuggled in. They would put them into false bottoms and, and they would put segments of the Bible in other books and they would put them into uh, containers that contained other things into the, the bottom, you know, and, and then they would get them and then they would... And all of these Bibles were starting to go out to the people. But Ten, Tyndall didn't just translate the Bible. Tyndall translated the Bible into a common English. That even... Uh, he, has a, he has a quote. Um, he said, if God spares me, because everybody wants to kill him, the Pope, Henry and Thomas More, until he died. If God spares me, I will cause the boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scriptures than thou dost. And the priest, he was arguing with the priest. And he was saying, I want the common farmer, the common guy to know more about the Bible than you know, priest. And that was his goal. So he, he took... Uh, the original Greek and the original Hebrew, and he put it into a common phrases that people could understand. He kind of, it, it, it's not a linear word for word translation, but it's written in a way that anybody can read it. That was his goal. And he made the, now remember back in those days, it was hard to print, but he had his books printed on little tiny, like something like this would be tiny, uh, because it was illegal to have these Bibles. King Henry made it a law that anybody who had one of these English Bibles would be tortured and executed. And anybody who supported Tyndall would also face the same thing. So uh, it was a serious business, but people began to read the Bible and they began to realize that what the Catholic Church was teaching was wrong. And, and Tyndall agreed with Luther to say, you, each one of us are accountable to God. In fact, Tyndall believed, as we should all, all of us should believe that the only reason you exist, the only reason you're alive is to find God and to get saved. That's the only thing that matters. And he said, but you are accountable for your own salvation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And if we go back to where I started, the beginning of the Christian church, the church in Jesus on the day of Pentecost, God made sure through a supernatural occurrence outpouring that every single person heard the gospel, the word of God, in their own native language. Exact opposite of what the Catholic Church taught. But the same thing that William Tyndall and Martin Luther and Calvin and all the reformers were focused on. This was a revolution 1,500 years after Jesus was born. To get back to that original start of the church so that you can discover God on your own. He believed that the Catholic priests were so corrupt in their understanding that they would lead you to hell by their false teaching. And the only way you could guarantee that you have a fair chance at salvation is for you personally to hear the Word of God and to study the Word of God. And he risked his life to do this. So what happened? The Catholic, the Pope, the other Pope, uh, wanted to kill him. And he sent a spy to catch Tyndall. And this guy pretended to agree with Tyndall, and he was a well-educated Oxford graduate, but he was actually a Catholic spy. We have a snowstorm. And he knew that Tyndall's nature was a giving man. He was a kind man. And he said, listen, I don't have any money. Would you come help me? That's how he got him, drew him out into public. So Tyndall came out to buy him a meal. And when he came out, he was captured and taken away by the authorities under the orders of the Pope. And what was his crime? He published the Bible in English so that people could hear the Word of God. He was undermining the church's sole authority. He believed that every man, no matter what their education, has an innate ability to understand the basic Word of God. How did his life end? It was about in his... Uh, 19, about, he was about in his 40s, 45. He was ordered to die, and they were going to mercifully strangle him first, 
and then burn him, the Pope, under the orders of the Pope. So they strangled him, but he didn't completely die. He regained consciousness while the flames were burning. But they said he humbly endured the pain and died without screaming or wailing. Now, think about this. The reason I'm speaking to you today is because of William Tyndall. Now, he wrote his, his Bible version in 1526, 1525. And King Henry didn't want to give him any credit for the Bible. So he had this guy named uh, Coverdale write a Bible. And he took over 80% of it was based on William Tyndall, but they wouldn't put Tyndall's name on the book. So you have the Coverdale Bible, which was published under a different name and with marginal changes from what Tyndall had written. The King James Version later, this is a hundred, couple of hundred years later, was written and they found, they had 54 scholars, so-called scholars uh, in England, put this together and then they produced the King James Version. They found that 84% of the King James Bible is from William Tyndall's original Bible, but they didn't give him credit either. It was 85% of the New Testament and 75% of the Old Testament. So this guy died without any kind of credit. But he is the reason why today we have this Bible in English. And, you know, it takes a man of God like this. We talked about Cornelius being an odd duck. A man who is persecuted from every angle, from his king, from the parliament, from his own head of his own church to bring about the ba getting back to the basics of what God said, not what preachers are teaching, not what priests or institutions or denominations, but to know that you could go to hell based on wrong teaching. So why not cherish the word of God? You know, that, this is why Catholics rarely have Bible studies like what we have. Sometimes they do, but it's a little bit more common nowadays, but not common. Because the same residual problem exists that only the priests can know what to teach you. But the problem is they have corrupted their own teaching. And if they would only go back to the basics in the Bible, and some, some of them are doing that, and you, like the charismatic Catholics who are getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, and, and they realize that. So it's not all, but the predominant group of Catholics are still under this uh, uh, obfuscation of teaching. And it, it's coming through men. And we can never do that. We must always take our own responsibility for knowing the Word of God, for realizing that the Word will save me, just like Jennifer brought the Word of God to that Muslim man. No one told me. They all lied to me. They all gave me false information. But there, Jennifer, who has studies the Bible continually, is under the influence of the Holy Spirit and has a heart to share the Gospel. But she's already prepared because she studies the Bible every day. And now when she sees the Muslim, it's not a big deal for her to share. She knows what the Word says. She knows it's true. And she knows that this guy needs salvation. Or, or he's been under false teaching, false assumptions about Christianity. And that is what we need to change. And the, the empty seats here today are disparaging to people like William Tyndall for those who don't want to come and study the Bible when they've been gifted it by William Tyndall's death and many other Christians who died to bring the Word of God beyond the borders of the Catholic Church, beyond the institutions that constrain men and try to control them, and you have a freedom now that people have not had, that they did not have for because of the corruption of the church. And you don't come and respect the Word of God. You don't read it. The versions of the Bible, here we go, about the time of the invention of printing in 1450, there were only 33 different translations of the Bible. By about 1800, the number had risen to 71. By the late 20th century, the entire Bible had been translated into more than 250 languages. 
and portions of the Bible had been published in more than 1,300 of the world's languages. But does anybody read it? Now you have the freedom to read it every day, all the time. Nobody's going to throw you in jail. No one's going to burn you. But these people, during the time of the Reformation, risked death. And now, because it's free to you, you don't care. You don't take it seriously. And yet, your salvation depends upon knowing what's in this. And as we talked at the Bible study today, you may disagree with what I teach. But how dare you disagree with me without reading and studying the Bible with diligence? How dare you disagree without talking to me and just formulating assumptions? And like the Catholic teachers used to teach in the 1500s, you take one little piece out and you focus on that without putting it into full context, without the Holy Spirit leading. And you complain about what you hear. Nonsense. You're accountable to God. Every one of us will be accountable to God. And you're accountable to God, especially if I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> if I'm telling you the Word of God, or if you choose not to participate, that you don't care, a complete indifference. I don't need to study the Bible. I just need to party, baby. I need to sleep in today. Sleep into your detriment. You're accountable for everything you don't pursue. It is all over the internet. The Bible is in everybody's hands for free. This Bible study is put together every week. You may not agree. How do you know I'm wrong unless we sit down and talk together? How do you know I'm wrong if you don't read the Bible in your own native language? You can read it in any language you want. Just like on the day of Pentecost, it's fully available. You don't care. There's no understanding of history. There's no understanding that you are accountable. And you don't value the Word of God. That's why you don't study it. If it's me, I'm thinking every time I open this book, what am I going to do? How is this going to affect me? What did I forget that I knew before that I need to be revitalized about? Did I misunderstand something? God, give me clarity. Blood. The blood of the church, the blood of the prophets, the blood of the apostles, the blood of these men, the reformers. They're on your hands. They paid for it. You disparage the word of God. And yet you'll bow down and kiss some priest's ring. The Pope had this man killed. for sharing the Word of God. King Henry had people killed, persecuted William Tyndall, and yet he's an adulterer and a, and a blasphemer, and, he, and, and, and he's this evil man. You can't trust the head of these churches. Some of them are good, some of them bad. How do you know? How do you know your denomination is teaching you the right thing? How do you know your pastor is teaching the right thing? Pick up the Word of God. It is in your hands. The blood is on your hands. You are now responsible. Is it available? And as William Tyndall said, he was quoting, I mean, he was living out what the Bible tells us. He says, uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 12, 5, 9 to 12, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 12. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him, to please the Lord. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. The teaching of Paul, the teaching of John, the teaching of Matthew, all of it. Jesus is in here. Uh, his word is throughout is the Bible. Also known to your conscience. You see, that's the inside voice that Tyndall was talking about that God put in you that you have the ability to understand it. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us or giving you cause to boast so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. Don't be fooled about outward appearances of churches and pastors and, and all of that stuff. 
you are accountable and you are accountable to answer for the word of God. Romans 10, 6 to 9. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth. Your word is really near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved if you profess it yourself not if the priest determines it. In fact, we're told that we and the church do not determine your salvation. We influence, we teach, we encourage, but you are responsible alone to God. Your decision. And by voting, by not coming and not studying the Word of God, you tell me what that means. Are you satisfied with your walk with God and the Word of God? Of Philippians 2, 8 to 13, Philippians 2, 8 to 13, and being found in human form, Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that every name of Jesus, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You must confess. You, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He will work in you if you take up his word. And you are responsible to do that. Work out your own salvation. How is it working when you don't come to church? If you can't even make that step. How is it if you don't come to Bible study? Are you studying diligently at home? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You would only know that's true if you read the Bible your own. In the 1500s, that was not taught by the Catholic Church. I don't know what it is, whether it is now or not, or what to, to what level. But it, from my impression, it is not emphasized. You still, they believe that if you don't come to Mass, you could be going to hell. You're, you're going to hell if you don't go to Mass, some combination of that. Do you need teachers? Yes, you do. Ephesians 4, 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are now to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. But to know that I am teaching you the right thing and to, to work with the teacher, you must read and study the Bible on your own. And that is the great gift we have today. And why do we have fewer people here today? There may be many in, uh, reasons. But it cannot be because everyone is seeking God. It cannot be that people are coming and want to hear the Word, want to study the Word. They are not respecting the fact that they have shepherds and teachers and prophets and evangelists. They are not respecting the Word of God. They are just doing whatever they want to do to their detriment. But let it be on your head. It is in your hands. 
It is not that the Word of God is not preached here. It is not that we do not have prophetic words, that we do not evangelize, that we do not attempt the shepherd. It is not that. My hands are clean on those issues. And to boil it all down here, as people got saved on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 came to the Lord. They were baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it says in Acts 2.46, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Well, we have a problem here because they all came together. Our people don't. They broke bread in their homes. I mean, some people will come and eat, but they won't come and study the, the apostles' teachings. They won't come and study the Word of God. You can't just study the Bible and not have fellowship. You've got to have fellowship and study together. They receive their food with glad and generous hearts. There must be generosity. There must be sharing. There must be a gladness in what you're getting. Praising God. We don't have people coming here to praise God, do we? How could we possibly grow day by day? And having favor with all the people. We will not have favor with people if we don't know the Word of God, if we're not generous, if we don't love one another, and we don't praise our own God. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. We have fewer people day by day. And people are not getting saved because how many of you know the Word of God like Jennifer and moved by the Holy Spirit to share the Gospel with someone? You're too caught up in your own thing. And the Word of God is not important. You can't tell me it is when you can't come to church and study it. You can't tell me it is if you can't share the Gospel with your neighbor or your family or your friends. Impossible devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And if you don't pray, and if you don't pray together, nobody's getting saved. This church is just dying. I'm not, because I'm, when this thing's dead, I'm going to be going on to wherever God sends me next. Because I spend time reading my Bible alone. I spend time, I'll pray to God alone if I have to. I'll worship God alone if I have to. Will you do that? When we go, are you going to do that? I will. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us, God. Please forgive them. They know not what they do, except they do know. <laughs> but God, have mercy. For each soul that will stand before you, including myself, I pray, God, that we seek your word, that we put it first above our culture, above our own proclivities and our own desires, that we seek you, that we honor your word, that we honor the men and uh, women of God who died to bring this word forth for us, who broke the control of the Catholic Church, who broke the control of denominationalism, and the Spirit that speaks to us individually and draws us into a personal relationship with you. May we respond the way you desire us to. We ask for repentive hearts, a change of direction, an accountability that we are aware of, that we are convicted of. How many of us, God, if this little church isn't here today, will spend time praying alone. We'll spend time reading your Bible and studying it with all we have. We'll spend time sharing the gospel with other people. We'll spend time praising you. How many are going to make it? How many are going to not rely on some institution or some priest or pastor for their own relationship with God? How many will take control of it themselves? How many? How many, God? How many are in danger of falling away because they don't honor you, the Word of God, or the teachers of God, the people of God? How many, God? How many?
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. So simple, isn't it, Lord? Fellowship. Share meals together. Pray together. Study the Word together. So simple, but how many do it? Thank you, God. Please pray as the Lord leads you.